fourth week of Advent. Next year we'll have the complete week because I think Christmas is on Sunday next year, right? So this is one of those great years where we get a, almost a full week to celebrate the fourth week of Advent. And so, brothers and sisters, let us begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, with your and brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. <clears throat> I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Christ eleison. Christ eleison. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech you, O Lord, your grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ, your Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. reading from the book of the prophet Micah. Thus says the Lord, you Bethlehem Ephrathah, too small to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is of old from ancient times. Therefore the Lord will give them up until the time when she who is to give birth has born and the rest of his kindred shall return to the children of Israel. He shall stand firm and shepherd his flock by the strength of the Lord and the majestic name of the Lord his God. And they shall remain for now, his greatest shall reach to the ends of the earth. He shall be peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. and we shall be saved. Lord, make us turn to you. Let us see your face and we shall be saved. O shepherd of Israel, hearken. From your throne upon the cherubim shine forth. Rouse your power and come to save us. and protect what your right hand has planted, the Son of Man whom you yourself made strong. Lord, make us turn to you. Let us see your face, and we shall be saved. May your help be with 
the man at your right hand, with the Son of Man whom you yourself made strong, then we will no more withdraw from you. Give us new life and we will call upon your name. Lord, make us turn to you. Let us see your face and we shall be saved. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you prepared for me in holocaust and sin offerings you took no delight. Then I said, as it's written of me in the scroll, behold, I come to do your will, O God. First he says, sacrifices and offerings Holocaust and sin offerings you neither desired nor delighted in. These are offered according to the law. Then he says, behold, I come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. By this will, we have been consecrated through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. with you. With your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Mary set out, and, set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the, inf the infant in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? <clears throat> Well, today in our discussion of the nativity scene, we come to one of my favorite aspects of all of our creches nativity scenes at home, the animals. Next to Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph, the animals are my favorite part of the nativity scene. And what nativity scene would be complete without the animals, right? And I've seen all sorts of nativity scenes from all over the world, and it's really interesting how they contain, in different parts of the world, those nativity scenes contain different kinds of animals. 
And so you'll see all these different animals from all over the world. It's a way that people and peoples and cultures can write themselves and their cultures into these dramatic events that happened at our Lord's birth. But in his gospel, St. Luke really doesn't tell us what animals were present. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't re he doesn't really say anything about animals. The only reason we know that animals were there was because he tells us that Jesus was laid in a manger, which is a feeding trough for animals. And I'm glad that St. Luke doesn't tell us what kind of animals were there because then we'd want to be too specific and now we get to add whatever animals we want, right? Into our nativity scenes. <clears throat> and the animals depicted from the earliest times of Christianity in the first uh, sculptures and images of the nativity and the, and the beautiful Eastern iconography of the nativity, the first two animals that appeared in the nativity scene were the ox and the donkey. And this has a deep theological significance that points to what I just mentioned, the universality of the Catholic faith. Because in Jewish dietary laws, the ox was a clean animal and the donkey an unclean animal, and one that could, couldn't be eaten. And for this reason, the ox represented to people in the time of Jesus, it represented to Jewish people and the donkeys represented the Gentiles, everybody else where most of our families originate from. And it's nice, right? Donkeys are cute, right? <laughs> but oxes are great. <clears throat> so, but in addition, there is a mention of the ox and the donkey in the prophecies of Isaiah that some of the early Christians saw as a reference to the church which Christ would inaugurate. Now, historically speaking, in the actual time of Jesus, what were the kinds of animals that would have been likely in the house at the time? What kind of animals would a family have owned that they would have brought in at the end of the day into their house? And probably donkeys would have been among them. And it, you know, it must have been interesting to have these donkeys hee-hawing all through the night in your living room, right? <laughs> Many historians believe, and sacred scripture scholars believe that St. Joseph would have gotten a donkey in order to, for the Blessed Mother to ride upon as they walked uh, to Bethlehem from Nazareth. And donkeys would have been brought into the house at, the, at night where they were staying. And donkeys were kind of like the poor man's means of transportation if he had to get, if a man or woman had to get a long distance. Most people in the time of Jesus could afford a donkey if you were poor or a middle class. Donkeys were common animals for the, for the poor and the middle class at this time. If you were wealthy, you might have had uh, horses or mules that were imported. So the donkeys were kind of like the Fords and the, mule, and the mules and the horses were kind of like the BMWs and Lexus of the day. <clears throat> and mules also would, like the horses, would have been imported because uh, Jewish people could not, uh, could not breed mules because mules are a crossbreed, right, between horses and donkeys. And in Jewish law in Leviticus, it's forbidden to crossbreed two different um, types of animals. But there also could have been other animals in the house with the family, the host family, and with Jesus. Most likely there would have been some kind of poultry like chickens or even pigeons and things like that. There could also have been cows, but that was a little um, less common for people to have. Most people had goats to milk, which is not my favorite thing. I don't like goat's cheese and goat's milk. But that was what most people, most ordinary people had. They had goats in their house and they would, or in their uh, possession, and they would milk those goats, not cows. But they could have had cows also. And although we have in our beautiful nativity scene, we have pigs and a, and a uh, swine herder, they wouldn't have been very popular in Bethlehem because pigs are not kosher. So people wouldn't have had, um, wouldn't have raised, most people wouldn't have raised pigs. And there also could have been a couple of sheep, and quite possibly when the shepherds came to visit the Holy Family, they may have brought some of their sheep with them, maybe on their shoulders or something like that. And Bethlehem was known as a place for raising sheep because it provided sheep for the temple. In order for lambs to be sacrificed in the temple, you know in the temple in Jerusalem they sacrificed lambs and goats and stuff, right? Everybody knows that? Uh, and Bethlehem was within five miles of the temple. And in Jewish law, 
the animals to be sacrificed had to come from within five miles of the temple. And Bethlehem was there. So a lot of sheep were raised and lambs were raised uh, there. And the most common type of sheep in Israel at the time and in Bethlehem at the time were the Awasi sheep. It's a breed of sheep that comes from Middle, Middle East. And guess when, their la when they have their lambs? Guess what time of the year they have their lambs? Most sheep have their lambs in the spring, like in the United States and places like that. But the Awasi sheep in the Middle East have their lambs in November and December. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so, so the sheep of Bethlehem would have been still grazing in the fields in December. Some people thought that it might it would be too cold. Some scholars and things in the past said it would be too cold for uh, shepherds to be out in December. Uh, with their sheep, but it really isn't true. Even today in Jerusalem, actually December is a pretty good time to graze, to have your sheep graze because there's still uh, grass from the wet time uh, in the Holy Land from the rainy season. So those who say that, Christmas, uh, that, that Christians only celebrate Christmas in December to replace a pagan holiday, have you heard that before? Have you heard that this on, on the news and stuff like that they'll say and in uh, like the History Channel and stuff they'll, they'll say that Christians celebrate Christmas in, on December 25th because it was an ancient pagan holiday in order to replace the pagan holiday with a Christian holiday. They celebrated Christmas on that day so the Christians wouldn't be tempted to celebrate the, this, uh, Chris, the, the uh, pagan holiday on that day. Who's heard that before? Raise your hand if you've heard that. It's, it's out there. But that's really not true. Um, they don't really know what they're talking about. Jesus very possibly could have been born in December, and who knows, it could actually have been December 25th. Now we also have in our nativity scene, you'll see in a couple of weeks, we have, one of, we have an elephant and one of our uh, three kings riding on an elephant. But that would have been very unlikely. There probably wasn't an elephant, but elephants are cool, so we'll have one in our nativity scene. <laughs> now, with all that being said, there's a deep meaning in the animals we find in our nativity scene. And if you reflect on it, you probably would realize this on your own. First, the fact that people place all different kinds of animals from their own cultures and their own parts of the world is a beautiful reminder that Jesus transcends culture and race and language. His message is for everyone, and in fact, there are Christians who will be celebrating Christmas in every culture, in every language, in every part of the world on the face of the earth. Jesus calls all men and women to himself and his truth and his love transform and enliven and purify every culture and people. And the second thing is the harmony between the animals and between the animals themselves and between animals and humans, which we see in our manger scene. Like you don't use, it doesn't usually look like, um, what's that sporting goods store, Cabela's? Or, oh. Cabela's, Cabela's. You know, you go in and you see the animals are attacking each other in the scenes. You don't see that in your nativity scene, right? No, they're all living in perfect harmony together. And that reminds us that God has called us uh, to care for, for all of God's creatures. And that one day we believe that when the Lord transforms the heavens and the earth, that the animals will live in harmony with humans and the animals will live in harmony with one another. We see that in the prophecies of Isaiah. But it also reminds us that we're called to care for God's creatures that we're called to be caretakers, not dominators and not destro destroyers of his creation. It's not our job to do as we please with God's creation. We're stewards, not the owners. God is the creator and all of creation belongs to him and it's given to us for our care and our use. Nature is God's gift to us and our closeness to God's creation makes us more human and more alive. You experience that, right? When you go on a beautiful hike out in the woods, and we're really lucky with all the beautiful parks we have in our area, don't you feel more human and more alive when you do that? Instead of walking between in concrete and between buildings all the time? And so we should use the brains that God has given us and keep advancing technology to, better, to be better stewards of the world's resources and to do as many things as cleanly and naturally as possible. 
and we're neither to hoard nor to waste the resources that God has given us, but to preserve and to protect as much as possible. That's what sons and daughters do with the gifts that their father gives them. They don't trash it, they don't waste it, they don't exploit it or treat it as if it's not worth their concern. And finally, God has called us to domesticate some of the animals. How many of you have pets in your home? Well, some of them are domesticated, right? And some of them are kind of wild, right? <laughs> right? Well, God has called us to domesticate some of the animals, to share our life with them, and even to teach some of them to live in harmony with humans and with other species of animals. One of the most beautiful things you can see is when there's a, a cat riding on top of the back of a dog, right? <laughs> it seems kind of crazy, but it shows that humans are doing their job in domesticating different species of animals. When we do this and care for God's creation, we bring about that pro prophecy that I mentioned in Isaiah. So enjoy your pets and show them special love and care. And be sure to take, God's, take care of God's creation and to use technology to minimize our negative impact on creation, while at the same time allowing God's creation to provide for our people and all the peoples of the world. And finally, enjoy it. God made nature and all of creation for our enjoyment and for our pleasure, all the natural world and all of the animals. As I mentioned, the closer we live in harmony with God's nature and with creation, the more human we become and the more human will remain. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. <clears throat> I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and life for the world to come. Amen. Let us present our needs to our Heavenly Father. For the intentions of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our Bishop David O'Connell, and for our priests and brothers, we pray to the Lord. For the men and boys of our parish whom God is calling to be priests and brothers, especially in the Red Bank Oratory of St. Philip Neri, and for the women and girls whom God is calling to be sisters, that they have the courage to say yes to him, we pray to the Lord. For husbands and wives and widows and widowers, that they may lead their families to greater holiness and fidelity to Christ and his church, we pray to the Lord. Lord, for the poor, the sick, and those in need, that the Lord may inspire in us new ways of serving him in them. And for an end to this pandemic, we pray to the Lord. Lord for the deceased members of our families and parish, and for those who have no one to pray for them, that our prayers may accompany them as they are prepared for paradise, we pray to the Lord. Lord for the special intentions of this Mass, for Anthony and for Frank Capriglioni, 
for Sophie, Mary, and Joseph Ciambrone, and for Stanley Small Sr., we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all the needs in our book of petitions, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> our offertory hymn can be found in the Pew Missal at hymn number 117. Comfort, comfort ye my people. Hymn number 117. Brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. <laughs> may the Holy Spirit, O Lord, sanctify these gifts laid upon your altar, just as he filled with his power the womb of the blessed Virgin Mary, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For all the oracles of the prophets foretold him, the Virgin Mother longed for him with love beyond all telling. John the Baptist sang of his coming and proclaimed his presence when he came. It is by his gift that already we rejoice at the mystery of his nativity, so that he may find us watchful in prayer and exultant in his praise. And so with the angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim.
are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy there for these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper is ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mysterium Fidei. as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring it to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and David, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life 
and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. the Savior's command informed by divine, divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Grace we grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grace we grant her peace and unity, in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed to those called to supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Jesus, I 
The communion antiphon for the fourth Sunday of Advent can be found on page 63 of the Pew Missal. Page 63. hymn can be found in the Pew Missal at hymn number 256, the Angel Gabriel, hymn number 256.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Having received this pledge of eternal redemption, we pray, Almighty God, that as the feast day of our salvation draws ever nearer, so we may press forward all the more eagerly to the worthy celebration of the mystery of your Son's nativity, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I just have a couple of announcements. Uh, the traditional service of lessons and carols will be tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, the first service was really beautiful, so if you missed it, come tomorrow at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's uh, the choir and then lessons from Scripture. It's really a beautiful, uh, beautiful evening. Uh, well, it'll be a beautiful afternoon, too, uh, on tomorrow, eve uh, tomorrow afternoon. And then also, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list of Masses for Christmas. There's a lot. So you, <laughs> you got them. Uh, you received the pamphlet, hopefully, at home with all the times. But if you lost it, you can go on the website and see them or grab a bulletin on your way out, and all the listing of Masses are there. And don't forget, if you go to Mass uh, for Christmas on Saturday, you still... We still go to Mass on Sunday for Sunday, uh, but there won't be any evening Masses. So the 4 o'clock, this Mass, and the 7 o'clock Mass, there won't be a 4 and 7 on, on Christmas night because we'll be having dinner. So, <laughs> so come, to mass on, come to Mass on Sunday after. Uh, and then all the rest of the Masses are in the bulletin or on the website. Also on Friday, Christmas Eve, there will be no, um, no morning Mass at 7.30 a.m. and no 12 15 Mass in the afternoon because we'll, have uh, we'll be decorated for Christmas already. And then for those who won't be here, if you're traveling for Christmas, on behalf of Father Nicholas, Brother Daniel, Brother Donald, and myself, we wish you a very Merry Christmas uh, and have a safe trip, uh, and we'll see you when you get back. For everyone else, we'll see you on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. God bless you. Have a great evening. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our recessional hymn can be found in the Pew Missal at hymn number 114, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, hymn number 114. <clears throat>